Are you constantly on the go? The newly updated Jesus Calling mobile app makes it easy to feel God's presence wherever you are. Read devotions and scriptures, purchase products, take notes, and so much more. The app is available for purchase on both Apple and Android. Download it today. God always works it out and, and sort of protects you from things that you don't know are coming down the road. So maybe that's what he was doing. But certainly football was something I loved. When you have these issues, these challenges, how do you move from these challenges at a slow pace, but going forward every single day to try to make sure that you know your purpose, you know you're walking towards who you ought to be, and that you're never shaking from that. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. What comes to mind when you hear the word catalyst? A shortcut? A dynamic experience? A transformative idea? The ancient roots of this word comes from a verb that means to unloose, to set free. Think of a horse hemmed in a barn stall. A catalyst would be an open door. This week, both of our guests today had dreams involving football. Both, however, had other gifts and talents they would see come to the fore and realize that the disappointing situations and tough choices that happened to them while on the way to their dreams were catalysts for broader horizons with bigger pastures. Dr. Myron Roll is a neurosurgeon who has traveled the world, making it a better place, using primarily his gifts, as he puts it, from the neck up. By choosing a path toward medicine, Myron's football dreams were cut short, but he was able to see the wisdom in having his dreams diverted. Inquarius, Inky Johnson, nearly died while playing football, but the spiritual mentoring he received during his years at the University of Tennessee set him on course to be a motivational speaker who uses his platform to travel the world and make it a better place too. Let's hear Myron's story first. My name is Dr. Myron Roll. I am a senior neurosurgery resident and global neurosurgery fellow at Harvard, Massachusetts General Hospital. Also a Rhodes Scholar, former NFL player, and chairman of the Caribbean Neurosurgery Foundation, author of The 2% Way, a book that um, chronicles my life story and uh, talks about a mindset uh, that helps you make small improvements daily uh, towards your larger goal. My story starts in the Bahamas. My parents met when they were uh, eight years old, dated at 15, married at 21. They've been married for 51 years now. They had my four older brothers in the Bahamas. Mummy was eight months pregnant with me in Nassau, but wanted me to be an American and a Bahamian citizen. So she got permission from her OBGYN to fly to America, where she had a few friends. She had me in Houston, Texas, and then she flew back to the Bahamas. And then I grew up there for the first three years of my life. And then uh, eventually, my parents always wanted to get to America. That was their mindset, their vision for us. They they often referenced Proverbs 29, where there is no vision, people will perish. They always talked about getting to America. That was a big dream, big goal. We were leaving behind all of the comfort of the Bahamas and starting over new in America, where the um, majority of people who lived around us didn't share our culture. And so in order for us to, I think, truly have success, they sort of injected into our minds that, you know, this was important. This opportunity was not one for us to become complacent. And we had to stick together, to lean on each other. We had to lean on our relationship with Christ. And if we did that, then maybe success would follow. From an early age, sports was a big part of our house. And it also made for a very competitive household growing up. All of the brothers were fighting or jockeying for position or trying to race each other, see who was fastest, see who was strongest, see who could jump the highest. Like every day was something else that we were doing to try to outdo the other. And my parents made it a distinct priority that we were to be good students before anything else. At that point, it was just like, if you want to compete as a football player, basketball player, track runner, baseball player, you have to do well in school and you have to get good grades and you have to join two or three clubs. And I really truly enjoyed writing for our newspaper and being student body president and playing the baritone saxophone for our local nursing home in Atlantic City, um, going to different states and building homes for Habitat for Humanity and, and volunteering in my church. Then when I became very good at football, and my parents realized that I was head and shoulders above my competition in, in my region, in my county, in the state, then in the country. Then they were like, okay, all right, this young man's got a chance at maybe playing professionally. 
I think the most important part of high school that really launched me into college was going over to Princeton University and seeing this big statue and uh, trophy display of Senator Bill Bradley. This guy was uh, remarkable. I mean, he, he was a Rhodes Scholar, the best player in college basketball when he played. He played for the New York Knicks. He's a senator now. Like, this guy is is ridiculous. So I went and like Googled him and I wanted to learn more about him. And then the Rhodes Scholarship kept popping up. It kept popping up. And I said, well, maybe if I want to be a true student athlete and balance what I've been doing my entire life on a larger level, maybe a Rhodes Scholarship like Senator Bradley, you know, accomplished, uh, maybe that's the next move for me. So when I got recruited by the 83 colleges, Division One schools uh, at high school as the number one rated player in, in America, I told every coach, and all the director of football operations. I want to be a Rhodes Scholar. How can you help me get there? So getting to FSU and and choosing that school, I believed and I was committed to their promise to me that they would do just that, that I'd be a student first, athlete second, that they would handle everything on the football field because they had an acumen of putting players into the National Football League, but that they would also help grow me as a leader, as a Christian, as a man, and eventually as a role model so that I can be in a good position to apply and eventually win the Rhodes Scholarship. My head football coach was named Bobby Bowden, huge Christian man. My first meeting with him, we spent 30 minutes talking like scripture and talking about Christ instead of talking about X and O's and cover two, cover three, blitz packages. He didn't really want to talk about football in the beginning. And my parents trusted him uh, that not only would he take care of me as a football player, but more so as a man. He was like a grandfather figure. And coming from New Jersey, they said, we can deposit our son into your hands and feel comfortable for the next three or four years that you will do right by him. One thing that Coach Baden said in that first meeting was, He's excited about his players getting into the NFL. There's no question. He would love to see his players walk across the stage in New York City, get their names called to be drafted into a National Football League team. But he's more proud and more pressed to see all of his players' names written in the Lamb's Book of Life and join him in heaven one day. And so for me, no coach said that to me during the process. It really hit me to the core. And from that day forward, Florida State was absolutely invested in me being uh, a true scholar athlete. I got to shadow neurosurgeons in Tallahassee, Florida. I started my own foundation. I got to work with the Seminole Tribe of Florida. I got to do human mesenchymal stem cell research during practice time. And coach gave me some opportunities to miss like 20, 30 minutes of the beginning of practice so I can do this research with my human biochemistry professor. I got to study abroad. No football player was studying abroad, but he allowed me to go work out over there, stay in shape and come back and rejoin the team. Just a phenomenal phenomenal man who has committed that promise from the beginning. Getting into the NFL and playing in the NFL was one of the more stressful moments in my life. And uh, I think a a moment where I disappointed people. And I, I think I failed at it just in the sense that I did not play very long and I wasn't a star. See, I, when I played football from the beginning, literally as soon as I stepped my, my, my cleats onto a field at six years old, I was taller, faster, stronger, more talented than my competition. And I was always at every level, either the best or near the best from Pop Warner to high school to college. And then I decided to take a year and a half off to go study at Oxford, get my master's degree in medical anthropology, immerse myself in a new culture, meet new friends, develop my intellectual capital, do all the things that road scholars do and uh, step away from football. And I, I was projected to be a first round pick if I had come out in 2009 instead of going going to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. Many people were saying, you are showing that you're not committed to football. You're abandoning your team. You don't think it's serious enough. If anyone else had a chance to be a first round draft pick in the NFL, they would go. But you are telling us that this is not that serious to you. And if you come back, why should we invest money or draft pick into you? Because if something happens, maybe you just you know run through a, a rough patch in the NFL, you pick up and leave. And then we have to scramble to find somebody to replace you. We don't want to invest a lot in you. So I dropped from the first round to the sixth round when I came back from England. I made $50,000 instead of five, six, eight million. I only played three years in the NFL instead of 10 years, which was projected. So I do feel that I was disappointed and I was disappointing to some people who looked up.
up to me. I would call my parents. I would pray. I would talk to my pastors, go to Bible study. I would continue to read journals about neurosurgery and my future. I would continue to work hard on the football field and show my commitment by being there first and leaving last. That slow process of getting to where I need to get to was a way to block out the background noise and sort of suppress and quiet down that frustration and those frustrating thoughts and to continue to move forward. When I think about it, when I flip it, I do find the good in only having a short career because I didn't leave with any concussions, any chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the CTE that's really plaguing a lot of retired players. And my hands are good enough where I have the dexterity to continue to do surgery and to live my second life, which is to be a neurosurgeon. I knew that football had an expiration date. If I had it my way, I would not have had it as early. But again, you know, it worked out how it did. And it is a blessing to be able to be in this field now, waking up every day, doing surgery, helping patients in the hospital, teaching young medical students who come through Harvard and want to learn to be a neurosurgeon. It's really, really fascinating thing to do. And now being a global neurosurgeon where I've had a chance to go to Zambia and operate over there. I've been back home to the Bahamas. I've been operating in Montserrat, Antigua, Guyana, Jamaica as well. It's really fun to, um, to now put all the work to use. It's fantastic. You know, when you're in science and when you're in medicine, you don't really speak too much about your relationship with Christ, like outwardly with your patients or your colleagues in a hospital, because everything is supposed to be cerebral and neck up. But I know that it informs the way I practice. It informs how I take care of patients, how I think about their cases. I pray before each case uh, to make sure I'm doing the right things, to make sure that I, I am prepared as much as possible. And if there's things that limit my human ability that I will like God to take over and have that intercession and come in and do what he does. But that's something that matters a lot to me and it's been helpful throughout my career. To learn more about Dr. Myra Roll, you can follow him on social media. Also, check out his book, The 2% Way, wherever books are sold. Stay tuned to Inky Johnson's story after a brief message. Sometimes life can be really stressful, whether it's personal day-to-day struggles or overall world issues that make us feel overwhelmed. But when we feel helpless, God is still there, ready for us to turn to Him in prayer. That's why Sarah Young wrote Jesus Listens to deliver a message of peace, love, and hope to her readers every day. Jesus Listens is a 365-day prayer devotional with short, heartfelt prayers based on Scripture, written to deepen your relationship with God. Learn more about Jesus Listens and download a free sample at JesusCalling.com slash Jesus Listens. Our next guest is Inky Johnson. Inky was on target to receive a great career in the NFL when he suffered a near-fatal injury his junior year at the University of Tennessee. After periods of doubt and uncertainty about who he was without football or what he would do now that his dream had been taken from him, Inky found that stepping into the dream that God had for him post-football would bring him the same sense of satisfaction and achievement in what he knew was best and right for his life. I'm in Corius Inky Johnson. Uh, I'm a husband, I'm a father, big brother, son, friend, teammate, but the world knows me as inspirational, motivational speaker, former collegiate athlete. And uh, I've been traveling somewhere north of 13 years on the road, you know, trying to inspire and impact the world. But at my heart's core, I'm just a servant. I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a son, and I'm a big brother. So my mom had me at 16, uh, right in a city, Atlanta, right downtown Atlanta. Uh, she took me back to 125 Warren. That was our street address. And it was a two bedroom home and it was 14 of us living there in the Southeast corner of Atlanta. You know, it was a pretty tough neighborhood. We had everything under the sun, you know, sometimes like a typical inner city. And at an early age, you know, I had this dream to make it to the NFL, you know, because I was coming up in a two bedroom home and it was 14 of us living there. And so me and my cousins, we slept on pallets. 
Right. And I remember the first time we used to play football in the street, like all the time, like get out of school, play tackle football in the street and just get after it. Right. Just pipe dreams playing. And people saw pretty quick, like, man, a cat ink, he got some talent. So when I was coming up through the ranks of uh, youth sports and playing football, I played at Fitzgerald Field uh, here in Tucker, Georgia at the time. And they had a great program. And once I got to high school, I was playing park ball all the way up until high school. Once I got to high school, I attended a high school by the name of Krim. And it was on my side of town. It was actually an Atlanta public school. And at the time, it was one of the lowest performing public schools in the state. And so everybody that knew I played ball and knew I had aspirations to go to college, they would always say to my parents, like, hey, you know, you need to transfer Inky from that school if you want him to get a shot at getting a scholarship. Right. Because at the time, the school, we weren't doing well in sports, weren't doing well academically and people just weren't going to college. And so my mom would come and talk to me and say, hey, Inc., you know, this school said you can come and play ball for him. This school said you can come and play. And I was like, no, I think I can make it from Krim High School. And she was like, yeah, I hear you. But, you know, the chances of that happening with the current circumstance, I don't know. And so people kept talking to her and I attended Krim my freshman year and my sophomore year people talked to my mother and they got her to transfer me to another school. They convinced her. And when she transferred me to this other school, great school, great program, football program was incredible. And I got there and I didn't want to be there, right? Because I felt like I could make it back from where I was from. I was Atlanta public school kid. I was from Atlanta. You know, I was at a school that was going against the odds. I just felt like I could make it, right? I felt like if I went to the other school and made it, you know, my cousins that lived in that same house with me, they wouldn't have had the same opportunity. My friends, my peers, they wouldn't have had the same opportunity. So it wouldn't have meant as much. And so when I got to this school, I'm not proud of it, but I really wasn't going to class. I was just sitting there with the police officer. I would talk to some teachers and they would say, hey man, you're extremely talented. Just come to class and you can play ball, do your thing. You can get a scholarship one day. And I was like, yeah, that's cool, but I don't want to be here. It was like, yeah, but why? I was like, I think I can make it back where I'm from. And so my mother just got tired of the back and forth and she just transferred me back to Krim High School. And my senior year, I ended up getting a scholarship to the University of Tennessee. And when I got the scholarship, it was a big moment in my life because after I went to college, I had cousins coming behind me that went to college. I had friends coming behind me that went to college. And that moment was important to me because I felt like if I could show my friends and my peers that we can make it to college from where we were from, I thought it would expand their vision and give them hope, belief, and faith that they can do it. When I got to Tennessee, Tennessee was incredible. You know, I had every resource on the face of the planet, you know, great program. I felt like with my upbringing, with the way I was raised, I felt like I had the character to be able to take advantage of that environment. And when I got there, I had two meetings. And my first meeting, they said, Inky, what do you want to accomplish academically? I said, hey, man, I want to graduate in three years. They said, what do you want to accomplish football wise? I said, I want to go to the NFL uh, after three years. And after my third year, I was set up to do both. And I ended up graduating after my third year. But my junior year, the second game, 2006, September 9th, I went to make a routine tackle. It ended my career and it changed my life forever. On that day, for some strange reason, when I went to make that tackle, fourth quarter of the game, at the point of contact, something different happened that had never happened to me before in my life. At the point of contact, when I hit him, it seemed as if every breath in my body left. I fell to the ground, I blacked out. I was like, I can't move. And there was a shot going from the crown of my head to the bottom of my feet. And it eventually left and it stayed in my right arm and hand. And they put me on the spine board, they wheeled me off the field, get me to the hospital. And they say, we're going to take you back, run some tests. And they take me back and they run the test and they bring me back into the room. And my mother comes in and she kissed me on my forehead, says, you'll be fine. It's football. And when she exits the room, the head doctor comes running in and he's screaming and he's saying, guys, guys, get in here. We got to rush this kid back to emergency surgery. He's about to die. And I was like, man, what happened? He's like, we ran the test. We noticed that you've ruptured your subclavian artery in your chest. and You're bleeding internally. He said, we got to rush you back and take the main vein out of your left leg and plug it into your chest in order to save your life. He said, I guarantee you, you won't be alive in the morning. I said, let's go. 
And the next morning I woke up, I had six incisions down my left thigh. I had one incision across the left side of my neck. They had bandaged me from my neck to my knees. 350 staples in my body. They said, when you went in to make the tackle, you ruptured the artery. When we went in to perform surgery on the artery, we noticed you had torn the nerves in your brachial plexus. I was like, what's that? They said, it's the nerve roots that go from your spine that controls your shoulder, arm, hand, fingers. Once you rupture them, they can't go back in. Said, so unfortunately, Inky, your arm, your hand, your shoulder, it'll probably never be the same again. They said, your football career is probably done. And I couldn't believe it. Right? Like, I literally couldn't believe it. I thought it was surreal. I thought I was in a bad dream. Like, I didn't think my career would not only end that day, I didn't think I would be left with a paralyzed right arm and hand from that day moving forward. You know, like, it's, it's interesting because I was raised in a church, right? My mother, my grandmother, uh, we grew up in a household to where I always tell people I got to see both sides of the fence, right? I got to see, you know, crime on one side. On the opposite side, I got to see a grandmother, a mother that was diligent, that went to church every Sunday, would try to be in church every Wednesday. And so I got to see both sides of the fence and I got to see the results of that. But just like any other kid, you know, you go to church, you go to Bible study and you kind of just make your way through. And when I got to Tennessee, my freshman year, I got locked in with a chaplain, a guy by the name of James Mitchell. And he's the chaplain for the Tennessee Titans NFL team now. And he was our team chaplain at the time. And he came to me my freshman year and I was talking trash after scrimmage, you know, joking. And he said to me, I want to disciple you. And I remember saying to him, like, man, what's that? I was like, that sounds hard. Like, what's that? And he was like, I want to disciple you spiritually. I want to help you grow. He's like the same way you study football, study your playbook, you do different things. He said, I want to walk with you through discipleship and help you grow in your relationship with Christ. I want to give you assignments. I want to help you. And I was like, all right, cool. I said, man, would you mind if I go back to some of my roommates so I can have a level of accountability? And we went through this discipleship with James Mitchell and spiritually it changed our life. And so I tell people my third year when my injury happened, it was weird, right? Like in the moment, I couldn't understand it. It didn't feel good. But once I got months out, years out, maybe two and a half to three years out, I was able to gain some level of peace about what had transpired. But also I was able to look back and see that God had prepared me all along. I had been in discipleship spiritually for three years already. And so my perspective was already changing. My language was already changing. My relationship with Christ was already changing. And so when I sustained the injury, my perspective, my spirit, my peace was already in a different space and place. But not only mine, the gentleman that I was in the house with, my roommates, my teammates, like they helped me more than anything. My mother, my father, they helped me more than anything. And so I would say, when I look back on it, like God was preparing me all along before this injury ever happened. It was just in the moment, I couldn't see it. The coach says it. Sometimes we can't see the picture when we're in the frame. When the injury first happened, I was in the frame. In two and a half to three years out, I was able to step back and look at it with a big picture perspective and see how God was guiding me all along. And I remember when I was a kid and I would see somebody, whether they were working in a profession or whether they were doing something as an athlete or whatever the case may be, I would always think like, hey man, they have to always want to do that. Right. Like you would meet them at whatever phase they were in in life, man, they have to always want to do that. And I think one of the common mistakes we make as people is thinking where we meet people is where they've always been. And that's just not true. So we all encounter serendipity moments in life. Right. Things that happen that we don't expect that send us down a certain journey in life that when people meet us and they ask, hey, man, how did you start doing this? Right. And so when my injury happened and one thing led to another, it was a serendipity journey. So to sit back and think about life and how we arrive at the destinations that people see us and arrive at the spaces and places and the things that we're doing, uh, a lot of it happened by happenstance, through adversity, through opposition. Um, some of the greatest forms of growth happens in uncertain moments. I journal for my meditation and devotion period every single day. And one of the reasons I journal, I journal to my children, both of them. I have a 10-year-old son, 
uh, Inky Jr. His real name is Inquarius. I have 11 year old daughter, Jada. And I journal to my wife and I journal to myself. And uh, one of the reasons I do that is because, you know, when they get to a certain age, I don't even know when I'm going to give them to them. I just journal and write in them. But when they get to a certain age, God forbid, if something happens to me and people come up to them and say, hey, man, let me tell you about your father. Right. And that'll be cool. They'll listen. But I want them to have something that they can often refer to almost like a guide as they go throughout life to where I write in their decisions, choices, uh, why I do things the way I do. Uh, our family principles, values, what we stand on, uh, what we live by, you know, why I did certain things with them that they may have not understood at the time. When I write to my wife, I share certain things. When I write to myself, I share certain things from whether it's challenges, whether it's fears, whether it's, you know, uncertainties. I'm very transparent. And one of the ways that I do that is every single day when I wake up, I do it. Around lunchtime, I do it. And at night, sometimes when I put my family down, I journal and that serves as, you know, my reset, you know, every single day that brings perspective, put things into perspective and that puts on my armor and it gets my day started. This is a passage from Jesus Listens, March 23rd, victorious Lord Jesus, help me to rejoice in my suffering. Really believe in that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character and character produces hope. It's so encouraging to know that pain and problems can actually be a blessing, increasing my hope. I realize, though, that this does not happen automatically. I need to cooperate with your spirit as he guides me through times of suffering. My closeness to you also helps me cope with problems, trusting that you and I together can handle them. And the radiant hope of heaven shines upon me, strengthening and encouraging me. When we go through things in life, I think the natural reaction, and it, it's okay to think this way or respond this way, I think the natural reaction is we want to understand it, right? When we encounter adversity, opposition, things outside of our control, like especially as believers, like we want to understand it. Like, hey, God, what's up, man? Like, what's this? Like, why am I going through this? Why am I encountering this? Like, we want to understand it. And I often tell people, like, even when I first started speaking, I was like, hey, when you go through something that doesn't feel good, that you can't understand, that you can't pull the grips on, like, don't try to understand it. Just survive it, right? Survive the moment, survive the adversity, survive the opposition, survive the challenge, right? Survive the rough patch, survive the uncertainty. And then when you get to a place of peace, you go back, you connect the dots, and you see where God was working all along. To learn more about Inky Johnson, you can find him on social media. You can also find his podcast and speaking schedule at inkyjohnson.com. If you'd like to hear more stories about when God changes our direction, check out our interview with Jason Brown. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we hear from the iconic original voice of Ariel in Disney's The Little Mermaid, Jody Benson. Throughout her career, Jody had to make big leaps of faith that were out of her comfort zone, but she trusted that God would lead her exactly where she needed to be. It just so happened that God's perfect plan was for me to become Ariel, and I learned and made a ton of mistakes along the way, but as I look back in this journey of 35 plus years now, it is truly a ministry and it's such an honor and such a blessing to have the opportunity to be the voice of Ariel, but also to just come in contact with so many amazing fans around the world. Want to hear more inspirational stories of people who have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then subscribe today to the Jesus Calling Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please be sure to leave a review, which helps us reach and inspire others with these stories. Plus, if you like seeing our guests as well as hearing them, you can find video interviews available on our YouTube channel at youtube.com Jesus Calling Book on Facebook and on the Jesus Calling Instagram page.